Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. Spring break is over. Spring practice is here. We are actually fresh out of a Beaver Stadium press conference with James Franklin kicking off spring practice here in Happy Valley. We're just a couple hours away from returning to the practice field, getting a chance to see these Nittany Lions in practice work for the first time in 2024. And of course, it's going to be a month of work on the field leading up to the blue-white game on April 13th. Uh, thank you for returning with us. We had a, a week off last week, went on vacation. Hope you all enjoyed uh, your start to this month of March. And we're going to have a busy one. It's 60 plus degrees here in State College. Uh, we've got football pads coming on. And to break it all down, Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallon back here on the Lions 24 7 podcast with me. Fellas, uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of a fresh start for a lot of, uh, of, of us in the media. We get new kind of eyes on this team. It's certainly a fresh opportunity for the coaching staff, which has three new coordinators. And for this roster, which has 20 plus new scholarship members. And as always, when you get back on the field in mid-March, Mark, we're removed from what happened last season. There's a little bit less of a feeling that this team is coming off of a loss from the Peach Bowl because we're, we're pretty far away from that. And hope springs eternal, although we have some things to address. Yeah, I think, you know, the weather, it's unbelievable because just yesterday it was like 30 degrees in Happy Valley and it's like uh, Mother Nature knew that spring practice was starting. So we'll see if they're going to actually practice outside today. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's every spring it's like a, a new sense of kind of hope, um, you know, just things kind of renewing, the, everything resetting. Don't think anybody was real happy with the way anybody at Penn State was really happy with the way the season ended. Uh, you know, kind of in hindsight, and we talked about this after the bowl game with all the opt outs and uh, all the people making early exits during the game. Uh, I, I guess that uh, outcome was sort of inevitable. And, you know, you see the way that that happened and to kind of turn the page and, and start moving toward 2024 here. I think everybody's kind of ready to go. But, you know, everything that we heard. Uh, it was a productive winter workout uh, situation for them. We had a chance to talk to Chuck Losey, you know, a week and a half ago. And, you know, he's high on the team. And, you know, James Franklin with three new coordinators. It's going to be interesting to see how things play out this spring. Yeah, you know, I encourage folks, if you missed it, we didn't get a chance to talk about it on the podcast. But uh, all three of us and, and our photographer, Grace Brennan, were in the Penn State weight room to finish off February on leap day. Uh, we had a chance to, to see this team go out through their max out day. Uh, some video of Nick Singleton doing some special things over at lines 247com Daniel had a full recap of what we heard from strength and conditioning coach Chuck Losey, who had some individual shout outs, one of which went in the direction of Julian Fleming, the newcomer from Ohio State, for his work and his rise as a leader early on in his career. But let's get to the freshest news that we have on Penn State, and that came courtesy of James Franklin via a noon press conference in Beaver Stadium, as I said. Full video of that available over at lines247.com, but we'll work through some of the headline notes here. And Daniel, I think we have to begin with the fact that two offensive tackles are sidelined this spring. James Franklin said they're probably going to miss uh, the entirety of spring practice in reference to junior Drew Shelton and recently enrolled freshman Garrett Sexton. We'll talk about Sexton in a moment because he's one of those hyper, hyper promising uh, prospects and one of those really compelling members of the freshman class. But Drew Shelton is someone who has far and away the most experience of anyone at a spot where you need two new starters to step up. Definitely. I, I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think that, you know, for not having Shelton at, at this time of year, I, I think that it's one of those things, as with most injuries, where it, it can kind of go both ways for you as a team. I mean, for for Drew Shelton, you know, you're trying to to win a starting job uh, in, in 2024. Um, you know, any chance you have to put your best foot forward to get out there, um, you know, I, I think is valuable. But, you know, I do think, um, you know, for Penn State, it's a chance to get a look at these younger guys. Uh, you talk about Javen Williams, Chimdi Ono. Uh, you have a bunch of freshman offensive linemen coming in. Uh, this frees up some reps for them. Um, so I think that Penn State, the way that they approach these things is they and they do a really good job of, of really maximizing things. Um, so I, I think that for you know for them, um, you're going to get a, a good chance to to look at a lot of different guys. Um, you know, for Shelton, I think the way that James Franklin framed it. I thought was interesting. He said that it was an injury that Shelton could have gotten surgery right away. He could have waited till the end of the season, or he could have waited until later on in his career. He said it's something that that guys can play through. Um, so, you know, I do think that where you are in the calendar, you know, I, I think that if you're Shelton, I think it's a good decision, you know, for the long term. 
you know, in the short term, you might miss the spring practice a little bit, but in the long term, you'll get to come back healthy, um, you know, and then really have the chance to compete uh, the, this fall. So I think you look at both those tackle positions, you can go a lot of different directions. Um, you have some, you know, an infusion with uh, Nolan Rucci coming in, which changes the picture a little bit. What Anthony Donka did in the Peach Bowl also changes the picture a little bit. And now not having Drew Shelton uh, through through the spring or you know probably through the spring changes it a little bit more, too. So that's going to be, a I think, week by week. It's going to be really interesting to see, you know, kind of what this looks like in between now and April 13th in the blue white game. Drew Shelton was spotted wearing an arm sling earlier this winter during a public event. And so not a ton of surprise that that's going to be something that lingers and maybe impacts him here for the next month or so. But we also want to remind our listeners, you know, this is a recovery mode process that we've seen other veterans take through the spring ball. I want to point to the tight ends last year. Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren did not participate in any of those 15 spring practices. We know what their role looked like when that team got in the field come September. So uh, we'll see what that means for Drew Shelton. He's a guy who approached 400 snaps on the field last year as the backup on both the right side and the left side. He, he pushed Caden Wallace for a portion of the year, ultimately uh, ending up reshifting focus to the left side by the end of that season. And he got the start in the Peach Bowl when Olu Fashnu opted out. He's got six career starts, two of them in bowl matchups, and then he closed out the 22 regu 2022 regular season uh, in, in November as the main left tackle as a freshman, now a junior, as I reference. Uh, and Mark, Nolan Rucci is someone who's going to be uh, factoring in here. Certainly, we've heard more about him on the right side, uh, but he has game experience on the left side. He's up to 315 pounds. James Franklin earlier told us he was about 299 when he got to campus. He was sub 300 uh, for most of his Wisconsin career. So you like the physical progression there, but a couple other names that he also brought into the equation, uh, J.B. Nelson, referencing his history, not just repping at tackle with Penn State, but also starting at tackle at the junior college level. And then you've got Cooper Cousins, who they feel like, and we've talked about this a lot uh, about his prospect profile, could fill a variety of roles, including the tackle spot. Uh, but James Franklin said they really want to keep his focus narrowed on the center position here in his initial semester on campus. You've got Egan Boyer, who, like Garrett Sexton, came to campus in January. But he's six foot eight, 250 pounds. So I don't think that's a guy you're going to be throwing at, at defensive ends in Big Ten play this year. Sexton was a bit more interesting, Mark, because all of a sudden he popped up on the roster uh, refresh last, uh, you know, last month, uh, late in February at, at 295 pounds. And this guy was you know, the big story. He was 195 pound sophomore quarterback in high school, ends up being a top 200 tackle prospect. But on signing day, he was announced at 260. So you're thinking, OK, file him away, kind of like Boyer for later. Chuck Losey says, yeah, he's, he's put on about 25 pounds this winter. But as it turns out, not really going to get to see how that translates onto the field. We haven't seen him in any kind of sling or boot or anything of that note, but we do know that he was limited by injury as a senior last year. And that's something that they were prepared to be dealing with when he got to Penn State. So, Mark, a, a lot thrown your way there at the tackle position. Plenty of names to know. And Javen Williams and Chimdi Ono are the redshirt freshmen. We'll talk about those guys a little bit later, I'm sure. But – there are not a lack of bodies here. I think that's the point I want to make. Phil Troutwine a couple of years ago, they couldn't even have a real spring game because they didn't have enough offensive linemen to put together two scrimmage ready squads. I just reeled off, you know, seven, eight scholarship level tackles that, that could step up and help their case here in the coming weeks. Yeah. I apologize if it sounds like there's some Buffalo running up upstairs here. We're having some work done at the house. So I'm, I'm muting and unmuting here as, as, uh, as I go along, but you know, Tyler, what it kind of tells you or what, not what it tells you, but one of the interesting things about offensive linemen is, is that they develop at such different on such different time frames. you know, Chimdi and Donko are, are guys who kind of came in physically ready and, and, you know, just big 320, 25 pounders. Javen Williams is a guy big and long, but what did Chuck Losey tell us? He still has to, he's at like 305 now, and they want him to get up to about 315. Uh, you know, Sexton and, and uh, Boyer, I mean, Boyer's a couple years away from playing. I'm not sure why James <laughs> threw his name out because we saw him, and that's not a knock on the kid. Because he could end up being really, really good. You just don't know. But when you see him, he looks more like a power forward. But this all brings me back to Rucci because uh, I'm old enough to have covered his dad, Todd Rucci, who was really a non-factor at Penn State as an offensive lineman until I think his redshirt junior year. 
And then he ends up being a multiple year starter and goes on and has a long NFL career. So you have to be really careful when you're sizing up these offensive linemen because some come in ready to go. I mean, Cooper Cousins is a great example, but there are other players who it's just going to take a while. I think the good thing is, is that they have the numbers there at offensive tackle, that they have enough players that, you know, somebody and, and ideally for them, it would be like three guys so they could handle it the way they did last year with, uh, you know, kind of rotating in Drew Shelton. And that brings me back to uh, when I asked about the offensive tackles, there was a pretty funny part of that press conference. And I said, uh, yeah, you know, we kind of – what in asking James Franklin about injuries, he usually tiptoes around them. But this kid was seen out in public at an NIL event with his, you know, Drew Shelton with his arm in a sling. And I said, you know, Drew is kind of spotted out in public with his arm in a sling. And, and Franklin looked at me like, what? Like, and I should have realized, I should have said Shelton, not Drew, because I think we know who the Drew in this program is with all due respect to Shelton because it confused even Franklin. And I think once it clicked, it was pretty funny. So I'll have to put that video up for the people on the site, uh, put it up on free, like on YouTube or something, because it was pretty good. I think a lot of the, our fellow media colleagues like jerk their neck toward you too, as well. When you were, when you were laying it out, Oh, Drew in a sling. And yeah, there's a couple of Drews and one happens to be the quarterback as we all know. And so there's there's the update and, and we'll learn more. I don't think we got the full spiel about who may be limited or not available in spring ball. That's what our eyeballs are for. Our reporting is for as well. We'll be out in the practice field. As I said, later on Tuesday, you'll see our VIP notes uh, in, in full comprehensive uh, fashion of what we see out of practice each and every week during the course of, of spring ball. Something we're looking forward to seeing is Abdul Carter, a first team all Big Ten performer at linebacker last year a freshman All-American at linebacker in 2022. Well, he's going to be playing defensive end this year. James Franklin, you know, peeling back the curtain a little bit on that process, Daniel, and discussing, hey, we saw him, and he's really said, I saw him as a defensive end when we were recruiting him at the high school level out of Philadelphia. Abdul and his father were leaning towards linebacker. At the end of the day, Penn State wanted to get him on campus, get him on this roster. We know what he accomplished at linebacker, but James Franklin said he's – been flirting with that line of maybe carrying too much weight at the linebacker position, 250 plus pounds. That's going to be carried a little bit differently now in the defensive end spot. And it sounds like while there was maybe a little resistance to defensive end earlier on in Abdul Carter's football career, making the, the transition to the college level, this was actually a move that was spurred by Carter himself, according to Franklin. It wasn't Penn State approaching him and saying, we got this plan for you. It was Abdul Carter really kind of driving the train for this transition. And James Franklin didn't really sugarcoat it, Daniel. As much as we really know the, the kind of presence that Abdul Carter can be, he said this is going to be a lot of work between now and kickoff. I thought that was a you know pretty good message from James Franklin when when it comes to this move. And I think it's a good reminder that you know that this isn't Madden. Uh this isn't, you know, it, it's a lot easier to kind of make these moves on paper uh when you kind of look at Abdul Carter and you see his body type, you see what his athleticism is, you, you see his capabilities, and you immediately think, oh, yeah, this could be an edge rusher. Um, you know, there there is, I think, a lot of work that goes into it. I think Chop Robinson kind of talked about that a little bit, a little bit of a different situation uh, there uh, with, you know, with him coming in and, and moving to defensive end after he was an outside linebacker at Maryland. Um, but yeah, I thought that was just a, kind of a, a good reminder from James Franklin that you know, this is still a process and still a completely new position. Um, and I think that we know that kind of, you know, the way that James Franklin and Deion Barnes and Penn State has developed these guys um, over the course of the year that over the course of his tenure that you, know, you do put a premium on athleticism and, you know, kind of the natural gifts at, at a position like this. But I, I do think that they like to kind of refine these guys and, you know, make sure that, you know, technique is important and kind of put them into the next level as kind of complete pass rushers. So now I think it'll be interesting with Carter. Um, I did, you know, I thought that it was a nice little window into things with the framing from James Franklin uh, about kind of the, the journey to this point. Um, you know, I think that kind of also reading between the lines with, uh, you know, getting approached by Abdul uh, about from Carter about this move. Uh, I think that mother nature probably had something to do with it too. <laughs> when you think about the, the weight stuff that, that Franklin brought up as well. So I, I think Carter has the potential to really take to the spot. Um, 
But I did think it was a, a really good point from Franklin that this is a new position. Uh, this is different. There's going to be some development there. Um, I think it'll be a you know a pretty cool challenge for Dion Barnes uh, to take this guy that we know what he's capable of. We know what he's done at linebacker and really develop him into a, a true edge rusher. You know, we'll, we'll see what that looks like um, when they kick off against West Virginia at the end of August. But uh, I thought that there was some good insight uh, from Franklin into how we got to this point. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, Franklin has a reason for, you know, everything he says. And I think that kind of putting that challenge out there to Carter that, you know, this is going to be difficult. This is going to take a lot of work. Um, I thought that that was really notable too. Carter with 11 sacks under his belt from the linebacker position the first couple of years on campus. That was an area that, that really picked up for him later on in his sophomore season after he kind of went a long stretch without being a, as much of an impact as a pass rusher as he was as a freshman. He's going to get a, a full opportunity to do that uh, under Tom Allen's scheme in 2024. And uh, just a couple other notes on some of those position moves that, that we saw take place this winter. Uh, Makai Flowers is another player who approached the staff, uh, was being proactive about his position switch, wanted to, to get a shot at receiver. We saw him play safety the last couple of years, very sparingly, took a red shirt in 2022, was involved primarily on special teams in 2023. Uh, but Penn State recruited him as an athlete. And this was a guy that they felt was a high level uh, prospect on both the offensive and defensive side of the football. He did a lot of really good things as a receiver, as a returner with the ball in his hands at the high school level, one of the premier players in the state of Pennsylvania. He'll look to make kind of a career pivot here at a position that, that needs some answers and is not lacking for young talent, but doesn't have a lot of proven commodities. And then Lamont Payne, I thought it was really interesting here. Not necessarily a surprise because he was the winner workout performer of the competitor of the day, three out of eight sessions at safety after making the move from cornerback. But uh, James Franklin was very complimentary of Lamont Payne's offseason work. He's a guy who redshirted in that cornerback class last year, now playing the safety spot. We've seen that transition take place in the past for guys like Zaki Wheatley uh, and, and guys like uh, Keaton Ellis as well. And over at safety, Mark, I mean, we've all projected this as a remaining strength of the program. You've got two starters back in Jalen Reed and KJ Winston, who really took control at the top of that depth chart in 2023. And we also have to acknowledge that uh, you've got Zaki Wheatley, who was not just Mr. Takeaway anymore. He's got a little bit more buzz, a little more broader buzz from James Franklin, saying that he has had maybe a, a, as good as a, a, an offseason as, as just about anybody in the program and, and saying that by far his finest offseason, they expect him to take a big step forward. And then you've got a guy like King Mack, who they think so highly of as well. It sounds like this is a position that's not just going to do well for itself, but could lend to other areas when they go five defensive backs. He talked about Jalen Reed being in the conversation for nickel coverage. We know that King Mack is in that conversation for nickel coverage. It's a role that was largely filled by Daquan Hardy during recent years. But that's before even getting to a, an interesting talent like a Dakari Nelson or the young safeties they brought in this last class. Mark, Anthony Poindexter has done a phenomenal job in this room. And as James Franklin alluded to, it feels like this is an area where Tom Allen might be picking and prodding a little bit to find the right buttons to push for this defense. I almost forgot to unmute and I and I didn't. But hey, we also what else did we learn? We learned the, the name of the new position, right? I mean, <laughs> they're gonna call it the lion. So I assume what wasn't that the husky at uh at, under Tom Allen at, 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 at Indiana? Is that what they called it there? I'm not I, I think the husky yeah. was one of their linebacker. Okay. Positions. Husky was like the hybrid linebacker safety spot. So, so I this, He's referring to this as the nickel, and, and we used they used to call this the star position when, when right. Brent I was around. I don't think they called it anything, uh, just Daquan Hardy's job. When, when, when <laughs> they when called it Daquan. Yeah, yeah. And, and now we're, we're hearing the lion being labeled that way. So, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll but, learn what that looks like. Yeah, to your point, though, I mean, um, what if we heard about Jalen Reed throughout his career from Anthony Poindexter, just a super high IQ football guy, you know, one of the smartest guys out there. Not that he isn't a really good player and athletic and all those things, but um, going back to where, what you originally talked about, Tyler, what are the ramifications for the rest of the defense? I think when you have a guy like Jalen Reed, uh, he's going to give you those options where, yeah, you could really put him in so many different spots and he's going to be comfortable and that frees up a guy like Wheatley, who I think we were all a little bit surprised by how little he played last year. I think we were all projecting more of a rotation type uh, situation with him and Keaton Ellis, and, and neither one of them really saw the field that much. So if you have a position that's that strong and we've heard nothing but good things about King Mack, 
Sure. I mean, why wouldn't you want to try to, 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 to utilize that as best you could, especially when there are so many question marks at linebackers? So I think you're going to see a lot of 6DB uh, packages because you have guys in that secondary, starting with Jalen Reed, who could step into that line position and do a lot of different things for you. Zaki Wheatley is a, a really interesting component because you look through the starting lineup that you project it, and he's not on that list, but then you remember how much he played the last couple of years. He was over 370 snaps in 2022 as a redshirt freshman. Then as a redshirt sophomore, as you said, Mark, we thought he may be more of a rotational piece. Took a step back, 250 snaps as KJ Winston and uh, and, and Jalen Reed really took control there. Uh, but a guy that, that clearly, if James Franklin is calling him out unprompted like this, he's in a pretty good place here in year, year four on campus. Uh, from safety, where we got a lot of things kind of figured out and a lot of names to know there. Uh, running back is a two-man conversation for the most part. Nick Singleton, Catron Allen, they are proven commodities. Singleton finished his, his sophomore year on a high note. Catron Allen was Mr. Consistent over the course of 2023. They're going to be, again, a spotlighted tandem at that spot. But with Trey Potts moving on uh, after one year here following a Minnesota transfer, they need a third running back. And when you look at the scholarship options that are currently on campus, acknowledging that Corey Smith, the four-star recruit, will be joining this mix in the summer, uh, none of these guys have played college ball in a game yet, Daniel. You've got the, the two guys who came to campus last May, London Montgomery, Cam Wallace. We were kind of you know, taking peeks at them in the practice field, wondering if they might surface in some of those non-conference blowouts in September. Never happened. Neither of them got involved during 13 games. And then Quinton Martin, long prized prospect in the state of Pennsylvania. They're trying to say, you know, trying to make him the next in state running back who follows the, the likes of Journey Brown, Saquon Barkley, Miles Sanders, and Nick Singleton. And he's done some really strong things here early on in his career. James Franklin, you know, shed some light on all three of this group. And, and, and as I keep stating, whoever emerges as RB3 this year, it's notable because they're going to be in the mix week to week, but they're going to be at the front, at the forefront of becoming the next man up in 2024 when I don't think any of us expect, as long as they're healthy, that Nick Singleton and Catron Allen will still be here on campus. Yeah, is this where I file my bold prediction as a Cam Wallace 90-yard touchdown run against Bowling Green in, in yes. garbage time? <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I'll finally get that one. Um, but no, yeah, I thought that we got a pretty good, uh, a pretty thorough look at what Penn State has behind Singleton and Allen with the running back group from James Franklin today. Um, I thought that he was pretty frank in his assessments of Wallace, Montgomery, and Martin. Um, you know, Wallace, he talked about uh, his his weight gain uh, and kind of his physical development. Um, you know, we know that coming out of high school uh, down in Georgia that I think he was listed at 175 on signing day. He's up around 200 pounds now. Uh, he said last month that uh, his plan is to play even heavier than that. Um, and, and he's retained, he feels he's retained his speed and athleticism. Um, and so, you know, I think that he's, it's kind of interesting to see where he'll be in year two and in, in sort of that development. Um, you know, Martin, I think kind of had a, a similar assessment in terms of, um, you know, there is some physical development to, to be done. I thought it was interesting that Franklin said that Quentin Martin came in a little more, a little more raw than they thought that he would be. Um, you know, given, I think, the level that he played at. So it seems like that there's some refinement um, that needs to be done there. Franklin also brought up uh, his frame. Um, he's kind of a, a taller, you know, longer running back. And so I think that they're excited about the the weight that they can put on him. Um, and that came up again, the physical development piece with London Montgomery, um, where I think that he is someone who has been a little bit more uh, behind the scenes and kind of under the radar uh, with anyone in this group. I think that it's kind of the, the cost of doing business when you don't have a senior season and you redshirt. And we did hear some good things early next year, uh, early last year. Um, I don't think we expected really to see him at all uh, on the practice field. And we saw him in August. Um, but James Franklin said that London Montgomery needs to bulk up. You know, he's still around 185. Um Franklin made the comparison that you're going to have to pick up the blitz against someone like Abdul Carter if you want to play running back in the Big Ten, and that's really difficult to do um, at 185 pounds. Franklin had a lot of praise for Montgomery in, in terms of the on-field stuff. I, it sounds like that he's making plays in practice, then he's making a good impression, but Franklin wants to see uh, the, the off-field stuff come along uh, in terms of physical development, gaining that weight, um, in the weight room. So I, I think that that was 
know, pretty interesting to hear kind of some some early candor, <laughs> I think, from James Franklin about that group and, and where they stand, because it's going to be a really, really important competi- competition. I mean, I just think that Penn State has been so fortunate uh, in these past two years with, with Singleton and Allen carrying the load that this third running back has kind of been, you know, very almost an afterthought. Um, you know, we saw it down the stretch of their freshman years, Penn state, you know, didn't really have anything behind them because Kevon Lee was hurt and Devin Ford left. Um, and so Penn state kind of, I want to say they got away with one there, but they were very fortunate, uh, with the health there, you know, they did a good job this year and Trey Potts was kind of a, a bit piece, you know, bit player here and there. Um, but you, know, you kind of never know what's going to happen at a position like that. So you're going to need these guys to be ready. Um, and so this this battle in the spring, uh, I think, is going to be pretty fierce. And something else that Franklin referenced is is that you know Kayshawn Allen and Nick Singleton they have their scars from battle. They they have accrued those over a couple of years. They played a bunch of football, so there's an opportunity here to maybe lighten the load on them when it makes sense. And and because you have seen nothing from from these other scholarship running backs in games, see what they can do against your top tier defenders. And and when that competition eats up, we know Jaywan Sider isn't just looking for for physicality here. He's looking for the psychological competitive edge in all of these running backs. And um, it's just it's just a room that, that we have a lot to learn about. We know so much about the top of it, uh, but because of the transition that's taken place and these younger components and the lack of game experience as freshmen, really going to be something that's fun to follow. And it's going to be pretty important to follow for this program at the position moving beyond 2024. Uh, speaking of the running back spot, uh, Mark, you're uh, our resident Philadelphia Eagles fan. So we'll throw this one over to you. Saquon Barkley, back in the state of Pennsylvania to the chagrin of New York Giants fans everywhere, including my mother-in-law. who won't stop blowing me up about this. She's like Tiki Barber. Uh, but we have a situation here where Saquon Barkley is making a lot of those Penn State Philadelphia Eagles crossover fans very happy but james franklin added a different dynamic to the conversation as well when he discussed this today mark yeah i mean i I was actually a little surprised james went as deep into that as he did but i guess that was kind of an easy question and he has a good way of kind of filibustering uh when he gets an easy question but you know a couple things on that front number one the fact that Saquon w- was talking to James and his wife Fumi a- about his career, I mean, I think it goes to show the sort of relationship uh, that that he's built. And, and I think sometimes we forget that, you know, you see Saquon in all these commercials and, you know, all over TV and just a beloved figure. And I think sometimes you forget he's a human being and who do, who are the people he leans on? Well, I'm sure his parents. And then obviously to hear that James and, and Fumi were, were kind of sounding boards for him, uh, I, I think was, was, was pretty cool. But the whole aspect of him getting back in the state, you know, we've seen Saquon around maybe once or t- once or twice a year. Uh, here in State College, and not that uh, being, you know, playing for the Giants was like, it wasn't like he was in Seattle or something, but I think just having him back in the state uh, state and uh, hearing what Howie Roseman kind of said to to Saquon about how he will fit and those kind of things, I just think it was all all pretty cool to, to see. I, it's, you know, I've always uh, been a fan of Saquon Barkley since he left uh, Penn State. You have to be objective when he's here, but even when he was playing for the hated Giants, uh, always liked him as a player, always liked him the way he carried himself, and I, I think we're seeing that again now. So, uh, f- yeah, from my perspective, uh, the fact that James Franklin is still such a sounding board for him is pretty cool, and then the fact that if Saquon gets back, if and when, and we, we've we heard this uh, about, we heard it from Ty Howell down at the bowl game, about how a lot of these NFL guys, when they come back, Ty Howell was talking about the tight ends, you know, the impact they could have. I mean, what do you think it's like when Saquon walks in for these running backs? I'm sure even a guy like Nick Singleton, they're probably all ears knowing everything that he's gone through. And he has gone through a lot now. So good to see good things happening for a good person. Yeah, a lot of movement out there. We, we saw Yitor Gross Matos uh, sign a two-year deal with the 49ers, getting himself a nice pay raise off a rookie deal with the Carolina Panthers. Uh, Mike Kosicki uh, going to what we expect to be a much better offense than the one he was involved with in the New England Patriots last year, getting a chance to play with Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. But, of course, Saquon Barkley, the headliner here, going from one division rival to the other, now a Philadelphia Eagle. Uh, that's going to do it for our, our recap of James Franklin's press conference. Again, see that in its entirety over at lines247.com, that about a half hour or so of content content. We're going to move over to our spring football roundtable series, which we launched about a week ago over at lines247.com while I was away on vacation. 
Um, we had an opportunity to, to go through a lot of key topics of what we were looking at, some of the questions we had about this program as they approached their return to the practice field. We figured today at the start of spring practice was a good opportunity to bring that to the podcast. So we're not going to go through our entire roundtable series, which you can see all of that at lines247.com. But some of the top topics we're going to work our way through right now. And we'll begin with, I think, probably is the external question for most people nationally, regionally, locally, otherwise, is the offense, Penn State's offense. They came their coordinator during the regular season last year after the second, uh, you know, second no show, essentially, on a big stage against Michigan. We know the rest of the story. It was a, a tag team kind of deal. J1 Sider and Ty Howell down the stretch, ultimately bringing in Andy Kotelnicki, who was named 24-7 Sports coordinator of the year on offense for what he did at Kansas last season. And we'll begin this one with you, Mark. Keys for the offense this spring. We're not talking about September. We're not talking about Big Ten action. We're talking about this next month of on-field work. Where do you put your focus for this offense? Hey, just by way of housekeeping and not yep. what's going on upstairs, uh, we rotate who goes first, second, and third in these. Uh, but we had to shuffle them around a little bit. So if you saw them on the site and it didn't look like the rotation was going the right way, that's why, because we had just for, for the flow of them, it, it went a little bit better, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, the most obvious thing is meshing what Penn state's done with Andy Kotelnicki's uh, system. You know, we had an opportunity to talk to Drew Shelton in early February or yeah, kind, kind of right there in early Drew, Drew Aller, Drew you Aller did, my God, <laughs> I'm screwing myself up here. Uh, Drew Aller uh, in early February or like that first week of February. And um, he was asked, you know, what, what's it been like working with Andy Kotelnicki? And he said, you know, they really didn't have that much time to do it in January because he was on the road the whole time recruiting Kotelnicki. Uh, so those, you know, this past month, I think has been really important in, you know, getting into the, the room and learning things. But that's one thing. I mean, actually figuring this stuff out on the field is a whole different animal. And I think it's just really important for everybody to get on the same page. Listen, he is not going to be able to bring the exact same offense that he had at Kansas and just insert that here. You know, one reason is because he didn't recruit any of these guys. These guys were not recruited for his system. They were recruited by, well, multiple offensive coordinators, right? I mean, they were recruited by multiple offensive coordinators. So, I think he's going to have to kind of adjust what he did with what Penn State has done. And he said that as much. And another thing that Aller told us is that Kotal Nicky would pop, uh, pop, would spring pop quizzes on them, which I think was pretty cool. But then he was also asking the quarterbacks for feedback on what they thought would work. But that's all the discussions that have gone on now, starting today, as we record this, they're going to be able to get out on the field and see how all that works. So I think that's really important to get that as hammered down as you possibly can, knowing what your season opener looks like and where it's going to be, because I think that's going to be a hornet's nest. And there's been such an emphasis when James Franklin brings us up and when we heard from Drew Aller a little bit later in February at a Thon event about trying to get it all locked down now in March and April. So when you resurface on the practice field in August and all of a sudden you're weeks away from your season opener at West Virginia, that you're not reteaching. You don't have to reteach to people. You'll have to obviously bring some young players up to speed who are going to be arriving in the summer. But as a whole, this offensive unit really trying to take a major stride with these 15 spring practices. And to me, you talk about the passing attack. You talk about Drew Aller's role there. It's hard not to look at this receiver group and, and put a, you know, kind of a big bullseye on them and, and, and say, this is where everyone's kind of looking right now. If you're going to take big steps on an offense, it feels like this room's going to have an important part in that process. And I love what we've heard about Julian Fleming and what he's brought to the room from an accountability standpoint, work ethic standpoint. These are not things that are surprising. We're all going to wonder if Julian Fleming, Fleming's going to, to follow that with his most successful, most productive year at the college football level. And he put up some, some fairly good numbers a couple of years ago as a junior at Ohio State. Wasn't able to duplicate that as a senior. Does he step up and, and look the part of a number one, number two type receiver here and, and have the, the production to match? But of course, there are the retained roster talent that, that really you, you put an emphasis on. Keandre Lambert-Smith, who was 
you know, cast as that number one wide receiver role for much of last season, did not able, was not able to do much for one reason or the other, the final month of the regular season. And, and then you throw in the bowl game and, and it just was hard to make a, 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 they kind of make sense of what Keandre Lambert Smith and, and what the passing attack put out there for the 2023 campaign. And then Harrison Wallace is, is kind of the ultimate tease on this offensive roster because we had guys telling us that he looked like the number one receiver last August for this passing attack. He led the team in receptions in the season opener against West Virginia, but because of a couple different medical setbacks, we never got to see him string together consistent work during the regular season. He got out there for some peach bowl opportunities, uh, caught some passes from Drew Aller later in that contest, but again, largely unproven despite how highly they think of him in that uh, facility. And, and I think you, those are just kind of the three guys you work with because they played pretty extensively at this level. And then the other guys are, are really where the, the enigma comes from. You've got five players now who are in their third year with this program at this position. When you throw in Makai Flowers, I think Caden Saunders is somebody who's who's looked like he's potentially cracking through at different times in his career, but we haven't really seen it go all the way. A guy like Anthony Ivey, we've heard good things about what he's done on the field. Omari Evans has seized opportunities earlier in his career, but he was largely you know, out of sight, out of mind during his second year on campus. And so you throw in the, the veterans like a, a Malik Mega, uh, like a Liam Clifford. There's just a lot of names here. Carmelo Taylor's back as a second year player. And so I think the big thing to note here is Marcus Higgins did not recruit a single member of that 2023 uh, unit to campus himself. And I know a lot of people were, were looking in Higgins' direction after the Peach Bowl and saying, what exactly did he accomplish in his first year? And I think we're going to learn that starting in spring ball, because if this group doesn't provide one, two, three, four guys who really notably break out or take a step forward, then that's going to be a major indictment on, on, on the development that has not occurred in that room. And so I think this spring ball in terms of confidence, it is paramount because you've got a lot of guys who have racked up reps, uh, you know, against their own team, but have not done it to this point against an opponent on Saturdays in a college uniform. And so to me, finding out what you have there and finding out maybe what you don't have. And, and I do expect this room to change after spring ball. I think we're probably going to see some guys maybe hit the transfer portal. That's the nature of this business. I think right now they're looking at 15 scholarship receivers on this roster otherwise. And so to me, figuring out who took the step forward, who may not be able to help you in a Penn State uniform, it's got to be at, uh, near the top of that priority list for Marcus Sagan's and this entire offensive staff during these 15 string practices. And, and Daniel, we'll let you take it from here on the offensive key. Yeah, I, I sort of split the difference uh, a little bit between you guys. I mean, there are other places on this offense that you can look. Uh, I mean, the offensive line, you have to replace three starters, but I, I stayed with the pass catchers. And I think a big key for Penn State uh, this spring is to kind of figure out what the balance is going to be with that group. You, you look back to last year, and they started in two tight end sets uh, 12 times in 13 games. No matter how many times Liam Clifford was announced as a starter on the scoreboard, uh, the tight ends ended up with more than half of the of Drew Aller's touchdown catches, passes, uh, Bo Perbula too. Um, and so I, I think that you just really want to figure out you know, your balance. I know that it helps if Harrison Wallace steps up. Uh, if Julian Fleming can be a reliable option, if Keandre Lambert Smith uh, is is consistent, if one of those you know billion other guys steps up uh, and steps into a big role, like, you know that will obviously help um, in this area. But I think that you just want to figure out how to find a balance with this offense in terms of where the ball is going and how you can use that to generate some explosive plays. Um, you know, you need to figure out who your most reliable pass catchers are among the running backs, tight ends, and wide receivers, uh, and then figure out how to generate explosive plays from there. Um, I, I just think that that's really key because, you know, I, I do think that having, you know, a good tight end room and being able to do these two and three tight end sets is a, is a, is a real luxury. But I think that we saw at times this year about how kind of bogged down the offense felt um, and how, you know, you need those wide receivers to be able to be explosive. So you want to find that balance, and I think now's a good time to do that. At Penn State, when you combine tight end and wide receiver since 2022, they've added 10 uh, players at those positions on scholarship. And you've got a bunch of guys who had blue chip kind of ratings. And, and, and you think about what that tight end room has brought in of late with uh, Luke Reynolds and, and uh, of course, uh, Andrew Rapier. 
and you think, yeah, that this is, could be a position group that continues to cut into what the wide receiver unit wants to maybe accomplish. There's a lot of guys you know, trying to get their playing time. Defensively, uh, again, new leadership here. Tom Allen uh, making the move after uh, being Indiana's head coach for, for several seasons. He was fired during the regular season last year. Uh, rather than sitting out and, and going to a studio analyst job or, or be, becoming some kind, of a, 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 some kind of consultant, he goes all in, linebackers coach coordinator here at Penn State. Not exactly a, a job uh, in between jobs. It's an important task. And James Franklin said that he feels like Tom Allen is really, really loving his his return to the coordinator status. And Mark, when we look at, or I'm sorry, I got the first one here, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm screwing up my own flow. When we look at the keys of the defense, uh, to me, uh, you know, Manny Diaz obviously had an elite unit. Uh, it was highly ranked, or if not the highest ranked in just about every category that, that really matters. And to me, it's about finding the right fits in the cornerback reload because we can look at defensive end. I know we're going to talk about that, but three cornerbacks who really readily left the field, 1,500 combined snaps for Johnny Dixon, Daquan Hardy, Kaylin King, guys who are now trying to pursue their NFL dreams. They're gone. And Penn State has found a really interesting way to maybe fill their holes. It's a mix of new additions. You've got a couple guys with SEC experience and A.J. Harris out of Georgia, Jalen Kimber from Florida. Kimber was a starter for the Gators. Harris burned redshirt last year as a freshman. Both of them were top 100 prospects. They think very highly of the prospects they brought in in January and freshman Antoine Belgrave Shorter and John Mitchell, both out of Jacksonville, Florida. And then you tack in that to the two guys who burned red shirt last year, Elliot Washington, Zion Tracy. Cam Miller is kind of the mainstay. He's been around for a little while. He's a junior. He's very, very highly regarded in this locker room. Uh, and yet we haven't really seen him cast into a role as one of the guys who has to lead the way. Aside from the Peach Bowl, which was a learning process for a lot of that defensive secondary and a lot of that defensive unit. So you think about Davian Collins, who made the move from Mississippi State last year. Um, and, and it's just a lot of names there. And to me, I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, a, a, you know, A.J. Harris or Jalen Kimber in that starting lineup with Cam, with a Cam Miller. I think we also have to remember that the safety room could contribute to what has been a kind of a cornerback job in nickel coverage if you have a Jalen Reed or a King Mack there playing that kind of a role. So only so many spots in the field. We saw them go three deep with extensive action and then Cam Miller popping up for a lot of reps. And then they still managed to burn two red shirts as freshmen at that position. But to me, guys, if, if this team wants to have that effective edge rush that it has developed the last couple of years and been consistent with it, guys have gone on to the NFL and we think it's going to be another good group. Well, one thing they've been able to count on perennially is high level cornerback play, NFL talent back there. The ability to shut down opponents. And so that's going to be tested because Terry Smith, I think, loves what he has assembled here. They've done a great job acquiring personnel. They've done a great job developing it from prospects they brought to campus. But I just wonder, can they find the right fit and roll it out confidently at the start of September? Or is this a cornerback unit that's going to have to go through some growing pains early in the season before they find exactly what those fits are? I think a lot of that starts to get sorted out this spring. And I'd expect we're going to see some guys really take control of the position and, and maybe some others, you know, kind of enter the summer playing catch up. And I think that's a good thing for Terry Smith to find it, figure out where the footing is for a group that is kind of a, a mixed bag of experience and, and background. And then we'll go to Daniel for this next one. I think we got a little bit of clarity uh, today on, on what mine was uh, with what James Franklin said about the safety room. Uh, I had to you know, figure out the new roles that are particular to Tom Allen's scheme. I think that you really want to have those. You know, this is the time of year where you drill those down, you know, figure out how this is going to work uh, for, for different guys. Um, you know, it's not going to look exactly like Manny Diaz's defense. So what is Tom Allen's imprint going to be? Um, you know, we talked about it at, Indiana. He had the bull and the Husky, um, the, the Husky, uh, I have, uh, our Jared Kelly from the Indiana site. Uh, I have his comments up where you know, the Husky is a sort of a nickel, a hybrid linebacker and defensive back. And then the bull as a hybrid outside linebacker defensive end. And I think that we can kind of read between the lines a little bit of who on the roster fits those descriptions and James Franklin bringing up the lion, um, I, I think that Jalen Reed is someone who, you know, we've kind of seen, you know, he's more of a bigger safety. Uh, I think he's up around 210 pounds. Um, he's not afraid to, to mix it up and run support uh, down in the box. Um, so it seems like that that's a role that, that he could really take to. So I, I think that 
you know, this time of year, you want to kind of lock in how this is going to look different with Tom Allen, what those roles are going to be, who is going to be in those roles. Uh, and then you can kind of, uh, then the roles, can, other roles can kind of go from there. Um, you know, Jared Kelly also told us that there's a lot on the middle linebacker uh, for Tom Allen. Uh, so, you know, Kobe King comes to mind there. Uh, and then, you know, if you are playing a, a 4 2 5, that's only one other linebacker spot next to the mic. So, who is that? It's Tony Rojas, Keon Wiley, KV on keys, Dominic DeLuca, Tyler Elsden. You have a, a lot of linebacker depth there. So you can kind of, I think, see some of the uh, position battles start to take shape there. So I'm excited to see how this comes together. I think with the Penn State safety room, uh, I think that it would be you know kind of exciting to see some more of that kind of big nickel look where if you can put KJ Winston, Zachy Wheatley, and Jalen Reed on the field at the same time, um, you know, with a four-man front, uh, I, I think that that's something that could be really, really interesting, um, you know, and a kind of a different look for opposing offenses. So you know, this is the time of year where, where you figure that out. Mark, we'll finish with you on, on the defensive end here. Yeah, uh, kind of building off uh, what we're talking about with Abdul Carter and then what Daniel was just talking about, I, I think – you know, figuring out how all these defensive ends are going to fit into uh, Tom Allen's system, I think, is really important. You, you're obviously losing Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac to the NFL. I mean, both of those guys, I think, really helped themselves at the combine. But, you know, Tom Allen has a situation here that I don't think he had very often at Indiana, where there are a lot of talented guys. And between Tom Allen and Deion Barnes, they're going to have to figure out how to allocate these snaps because even with those guys gone, I mean, I think the one given here uh, is deny Dennis Sutton. And for the record, uh, Tyler and I saw him at, at, at an event and we asked him how tall he was. And he said he hadn't been measured since his freshman year. So that's where that six, five comes from, even though that wasn't all that long ago, but there's no way that he's six, five, but he was essentially a starter last year. I mean, he started a couple games when chop was out and then obviously in the bowl game. Uh, but other than that, he rotated in and I don't have the snap numbers in front of me, but I'm sure he was right up there uh, with chop and Adisa in terms of how many snaps he had. But so he's a given. But I don't think you could say Abdul Carter's a given, especially hearing what we heard from James Franklin today, where it's like, yeah, this guy's got, got – he has a ways to go. You know, I think that the next guy in line, Zariah Fisher, uh, I thought he played really well, and it looks like he's really embraced becoming a, a defensive end. He's up to 262 pounds now, and you see him, and he doesn't look like he's heavy at all. We know that Smith Vilbert – Tyler, you wrote the great story on Smith Vilbert. He's back in the mix – He's talking about being an outside, inside type guy. Uh, Amin Vanover, I was kind of surprised. I went back and looked. He didn't play last year nearly as much, I know, as we as as I recalled him playing, if that makes sense. It seemed like he made a bigger impact, but I know he was banged up a little bit. But uh, he's a guy who I think has an opportunity to do some really good things as well. And then you're bringing in Jalen Harvey, uh, a true freshman who is – 266 pounds now yes and then i'm leaving out the guy who i, I don't want to i i don't want to give a sneak peek to, to one of my future answers uh but i think jameel lyons you know when you hear what people in the program say about him how he came in last year as a true freshman and was just mature and uh, you know, carried himself the right way, had the size and the athleticism to contribute. I think they were hoping to redshirt him until Vanover, Vanover and Chop got hurt, and then they had to pull that redshirt. And he and he played. I thought he acquitted himself well when he was out there. And Chuck Losey a couple weeks ago tells us how athletic this guy is. And when Chuck Losey's telling you a guy super athletic, you know, wow. So I'm throwing a lot of names out there, and that's not even that's not even all the scholarship guys. Those are the guys that I think I don't think I missed anybody who we project to be kind of in that main rotation. But if you're looking for a four or five man rotation, I mean, you're going to have to figure out how to allocate snaps among all those people. Abdul Carter isn't moving to defensive end to be a backup, right? I mean, so I don't know that he's immediately a starter. I would, I, I guess he's immediately a starter. I don't know. But th th this, these are the things that you have to figure out uh, during the spring because, again, I think when you look at that opening game at West Virginia 
you are not going to be able to ease yourself in. I mean, you know what that game's going to be like. After the way West Virginia lost and after after or knowing what West Virginia fans are like, and I mean that in a, compl- in a complimentary way, that they're, you know, they're going to get after it and it's going to be a crazy atmosphere, this may seem like a, 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 an embarrassment of riches and a good problem to have, but it's a problem nonetheless and that they have to figure out who are going to be the key guys and who's going to get the bulk of the snaps. Just a few follow-ups on some of the things you said. Uh, last year, then I then a sudden did lead all defensive ends in total snaps. He had about 45 more than Adiza Isaac. Of course, Chop Robinson missed a couple games, and, and in his place, then I then a sudden started. Um, and and Abdul Carter played about 50 snaps more than any other defender. So uh, I know we talked about maybe penciling in him, uh, penciling him as a starter rather than writing it in pen, but it was hard to take off the field last year. I think that's going to be the case again uh, this year. And then just two other things. Zariah Fisher was named competitor of the day from his position group, the de- whole entire defensive line, not just the defensive end group, the defensive tackles in there too. He was named the competitor of the day four times out of eight winter workout sessions. No Penn State player had more individual accolades during winter workouts than did Zariah Fisher, who's a redshirt uh, senior now. And I'll just throw this out there. Multiple people in team facilities have told me they think Jameel Lyons is going to be a very high-level NFL draft prospect. And we've only seen the flashes on the field so far, but this is his first spring practice. He he got to campus last summer, so he could really make uh, up some ground in the coming weeks. And and I'm with you, Mark. A lot of names to mention, and and that's after losing two high-caliber NFL players in in, in Adiza Isaac and Chop Robinson. Let's go to individual breakout picks here. We're going to go both sides of the ball before we, uh, as we finish up our discussion here, and we'll go to practice field later uh, to learn more about this team. But Daniel, we'll begin with you. We'll stick on the defensive side of things. Individual breakout for spring ball. Who do you have? I've got someone that uh, we we just covered a little bit of ground about, uh, Zariah Fisher, um, the the veteran defensive end who. He's kind of spent most of his career uh, behind the scenes, whether it was making the adjustment in the switch from linebacker to defensive end, uh, whether it was because of injury and whether it was because of the amount of talent uh, that Penn State had there. But uh, I think that he did a nice job last year kind of asserting himself in that rotation uh, behind Robinson, Isaac and Dennis Sutton. I think that he anecdotally, I, I thought he flashed a little bit. I thought that he had some good speed off of the edge. You, know, you look at how he's changed his body and you know Mark brought him brought up him being listed at 262 pounds. Um, that's what you're going to need to do if you're going to want to play against the run too uh, in the Big Ten and beyond. So I think that Fisher, you know, we, we've talked about these winter workout shout outs that, you know, how much do you want to read into them? Uh, you know, how much can you really you know project forward off of them? You know, I made the point that I think it's more about who you do see than who you don't see in terms of where you should put the stock. And so I think that seeing Zariah Fisher there from the entire uh, defensive line group, you know, that's a group that has, I think, a couple guys, that, more than a couple guys that are going to play in the NFL. And Zariah Fisher isn't kind of not one of the first ones off the top of your head. I think that really says something about him. And I think he'll be in a, a really good position to be able to compete for, you know, a, a, you know, a role in the top three of that rotation get a lot of playing time and, and make something happen. Interesting path for Fisher recruit uh, comes to campus linebacker year one uh, loses much of the 2022 year because of an injury before he gets back late. And now here he is year five and there is some buzz around him. I'm going to go with someone who, whose career has been a little bit more straightforward before we turn to you, Mark and, and, and Tony Rojas. Uh, I think the launch pad we all know is there for him right now, especially with Abdul Carter's move from linebacker to defensive end. Rojas has multiple uh, spots where he could emerge as the starter uh, at linebacker this year, I believe. And and after gaining 20 plus pounds in his first semester last year, and he ended up leading the team in tackles during the blue white game with nine of them. I mean, we all kind of thought that it was inevitable that he was going to emerge as some kind of defensive force, but because of their health at linebacker and because of the quality of play that they got at the top of the depth chart, he was more of a guy who got involved in later stages of blowout wins, consistently involved in special teams coverage, uh, we all know that that Maryland game, I think he played like 12 defensive snaps and forced two turnovers and the uh, in the uh, bowl game down in Atlanta. It felt like when he was on the field, his name was being called a bunch. So very active when given these opportunities, very productive when given these opportunities. So what does it look like when you spread it out over 40, 50 snaps per game? I think we'll have an opportunity to see that with Rojas. Um, and I'm really curious to hear more about his leadership 
uh, qualities that have, have begun to pop up in some conversations. Hard to do that as a freshman. Everything was about his physical work and his progress in that department and how instinctive and reactive he was on a power five practice field right out of the gates. And I think now that he's so so confident in those abilities and, and a lot of that stuff is now second nature to him rather than having to learn it this spring and then going into the summer eventually i think there's a real chance for him as much as a sophomore can do a sophomore hasn't started any games to this point i think there's a real chance to him to be one of the voices on this defense when it matters most and ultimately to be one of the faces of this defense by 2025 so i'm buying in i don't think any of us have taken a foot off of the uh, tony rojas buzz bandwagon since last year but I think it's really going to start to, to reach another level this spring now that the opportunities are in front of him. And and uh, Mark, we'll finish with you here, your defensive breakout pick for the spring. Yeah, I kind of teased it before. It's Jameel Lyons. And just a, a couple extra things. I won't go too long here because we we uh, already discussed him kind of at length. But uh, in talking to him at the availability they had earlier this year, uh, said he reported about 235. He's pushing 255 now. And he said he would like to maybe get to 260, and that'll be about it for him. But he's got a 6'5 frame. So this is a long player. Last season, he only had six tackles, but 2.5 uh, were for loss and a sack. So in limited time, you know, he was able to really flash. And then one last thing, I pulled up the quote uh, from Chuck Losey. Jameel Lyons is another guy who has emerged this offseason. Just unbelievable athleticism. I mean, we know that Chuck Losey, we know what he's about, you know, he's like no nonsense. And he's not saying that unless this guy is, is really doing some great things. So again, I think you couple that with the maturity and everything else. And then the fact that, you know, he told us how much he learned going against Olu in practice all the time. I just think he has such a high upside that they're going to have to find snaps from when it goes back to what I was saying. Okay. So now, Here's another guy. How are you going to fit him in? These were problems that Tom Allen did not have at Indiana. That's absolutely true. Um, and, and let's talk about our offensive breakout picks now. And um, I got us uh, started on this one. And I'm going with uh, someone who felt like kind of the breakout of the Peach Bowl for Penn State and what was kind of an otherwise disappointing performance. Anthony Donka generated a lot of excitement with his second half of work against Ole Miss in relief of Caden Wallace at right tackle. We've covered this a quite a few times on the podcast, but just to hammer home the point, he had not played tackle in game action at the college level. He did not play tackle in game action at the high school level. He was a guard all the way, uh, got some opportunities on the practice field late in November, carried that into December, and here he is, my pick in March as a breakout performer on offense, and he's going to get every opportunity to go out and win that right tackle job. Uh, he's a guy they still think could play guard, but I think there's a lot of excitement and focus on what he can accomplish on the perimeter. I know Anthony Donka himself was very encouraged and motivated by how he finished out year one. Everything we've heard about this guy in terms of fitting the culture, work ethic, uh, physical preparedness has been at an elite level. And that really goes back to the sophomore or the, the summer that preceded his senior year of high school when he didn't miss a single Penn State practice uh, prospect camp and got a lot of work logged in with uh, Frank Leonard and Phil Troutwine. And clearly that paid off in year one as he was a guy who was able to maintain that redshirt status, but ultimately played more than any of his offensive line classmates. And it was a really talented, uh, prized offensive line class last year. And I think Anthony Donka, while he's going to be dealing with at least Nolan Rucci at right tackle, we, as we understand it, um, is going to have an excellent chance over the course of this spring to start to validate some of the whispers and, and maybe not so much whispers. Lennon Tengwall was kind of trumpeting it here on the podcast not too long ago and comparing him to Olu Fashionu. And that's not the first person in Penn State facilities who have brought up and connecting the dots between Anthony Donka and the All-American offensive tackle who's going to be off the board early in the upcoming NFL draft. So to me, uh, Donka embracing that reality at tackle, and, and and from what we've heard about Chuck, Lo from what we heard from Chuck Losey, again, everything he says, you take it for gospel because he's not just throwing out names throughout names. He identified Anthony Donka among the most impressive performers from the winter workouts in the last month or so. And he didn't shy away himself from saying that Anthony Donka is going to have a pretty substantial role here in 2024. So a lot to like about that offensive line class. I think we've got another guy that's going to get mentioned in this conversation as well from last year. But uh, surprising to me and surprising to many, perhaps, Anthony Donka is leading that conversation when we're talking about 2023 offensive linemen. I think he's got a realistic shot 
to emerge as the as the guy at right tackle, though I, I would not rule out a rotational approach which we have seen from Phil Troutwine in the past. Yeah, and I, I think for my breakout pick on the offense, we're going to stay in that class, stay in that position group. Uh, I have Chimdi Ono as, as a breakout player this spring. Now, I don't necessarily th- know that this ends with him winning that left tackle job uh, you know, by the time West Virginia comes around because you've got Drew Sheldon, you've got Javen Williams there. Um, but I, I just think that Kim Diono's physical development really stands out to me. Um, you know, he's listed at 323 pounds uh, on the roster right now. He came in at 275 last summer. Um, he still, you know, he's carrying it well. I think he's got a really good frame. Um, and I think that he's someone where with, with his trajectory, I, I just think it's you know, it's kind of poised to be a, to be a breakout here. He's a late riser in the recruiting process. Um, I think that when we saw him uh, last summer at Lift for Life, Tyler, I think we're both kind of surprised at, at how he came in kind of at 275, but looked really lean, looked really long. You could really kind of see the, you know, what Phil Troutwine had to work with there. Um, and I think that that was a, a little bit of a surprise, you know, for someone that was an old Dominion commit, really kind of came on really late in the process, comes from a program uh, outside of Baltimore at, at Dundalk that you know, is a solid public school program, but isn't one of those like DC area powers where that is constantly turning out D1 talent. Um, so I think that he was a pleasant surprise how he came in. I think it's really clear that he's really taken to this uh, at the college level. He said that he's kept his athleticism like Javen Williams. He was a thrower um, in high school. So he's got that lower body and, and the footwork there. And so I think that he's someone by the time we get to the blue white game in April can really be turning heads. Um, I don't know what that would mean for this fall, but I think that he is someone who by the, by the time we get to April uh, a month from tomorrow, you know, we'll be having really, really good things to say about Chim Diono and his future with this program. He told us last month, you know, the cross training was great at tackle. Comfort levels higher on the left side. I'd imagine him and Javen Williams, if you're looking for silver linings with, with the, Drew Shelton being sidelined, it's the fact that those guys are going to get pretty loaded up with opportunities to show where they're at in year two after taking a red shirt. Mark, I think listeners out there, viewers out there are probably saying, anybody going to throw a wide receiver name our way here? That's a That's a room that needs to break out. Will you be the one, Mark? Finish this off here. No, I actually was going to go with Javen. And then I figured, you know what? If, if we're saying these are guys to watch, you, you two have them watching the offensive tackles already. So they will see they, they will see Javen. No, listen, I just think there's so many question marks about receiver that I honestly, I'm not sure who is going to be, you know, emerge. You know, I'm anxious to see Julian Fleming, obviously. Uh, but But beyond that, you know, if I'm looking for a guy who has an opportunity that didn't do a whole heck of a lot last year. Uh, I'm looking at tight end Andrew Rappelier. I mean, this is a guy who I think any other program, most other programs, he plays as a true freshman. I forgot, just going back and researching this, and Tyler, I know you follow the recruiting more closely than I do, but that he reclassified to 2023. So he came in here at 6'4", 250, physically ready to go, according to Ty Howell, mature, you know, j- just w- w- was everything you're kind of looking for. They had the luxury because of the players in front of him that they did not have to play them. And I think even with Khalil Dinkins, you see what he was able to do when he played, you know, touchdown machine. So I'm not sure where you were going to fit him in. Well, now, I mean, obviously, I think you're going to find a place to, to to fit him in. I mean, his eligibility clock is running, and Theo Johnson's off to the NFL. One of the things Ty Howell told you down at the bowl game before somebody cut him off, and I won't say who, uh, is the best thing for him is being in the room with those guys, meaning Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson, seeing what these pros look like because these guys are pros. And what Ty Howell was saying is these guys conduct themselves like pros. They carry themselves like pros. And just think of, you know, what that means to a young tight end to be in that room with those players. And it went beyond that. I mean, Howell said that Fryermuth came back, Gasicki came back. These guys had impacts on all these tight ends, but that that uh, Rappelier 
was like a sponge listening to all of them. So rather than coming in here, and again, a player who probably is going to be on the field as a true freshman at the majority of college programs and, and, and pouting and, and not being happy because you're redshirting, he used it as a learning experience. And I'm just really looking forward. You, you see, we saw him uh, last year, and you want to talk about somebody who passed the eye test right off the bat. And he's just, I'm sure he's gotten bigger. He's gotten faster. And I just think he's going to be one of the, he's kind of going to be the next guy in that line uh, that, that really steps up and emerges as an NFL prospect. That's not to say that a Dinkins may not, or a Jerry Cross may not, but I look at this guy and he just seems to have all the tools. So he's somebody I'm keeping an eye on. And obviously with Tyler Warren, I think you're going to see the coaching staff really take it easy on him. Uh, wisely. So uh, we, we know, uh, that how high the pro scouts are on, on him because as you watch the combine, Daniel Jeremiah was talking as much about about Tyler Warren as he was Theo Johnson, and uh, so I think everybody realized how valuable Tyler Warren is. No sense to put him at serious risk this this spring. That opens up more snaps, and I think Rapelier is a guy who's going to take advantage of it. I love the an answer that Rapelier gave me when I sat down with him last month and, and talking about Tyler Warren coming back. He said, on the surface, you might think I was rooting for Tyler to leave and saying, oh, the two stars are gone. Look at all this opportunity. But then he said, now I know whether we're on the road, at home, no matter the circumstances, I can turn to my right or my left, ask Tyler Warren what I need to be doing in this circumstance, and he'll have the right answer for me. And that's huge. And there's a lot of competition in that room. But I, I think there's a, a lot of, to make, though, the parallels I've said before to Pat Fryermuth. Another guy who reclassified at a prep school in New England. Another guy who came to campus physically ready to compete. The difference is Pat Fryermuth walked into a tight end room that had just lost Mike Kosicki and didn't have a lot of viable options from the veteran unit. This is a guy who showed up and, and saw Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren at the top of the totem pole and other top 24-7 prospects around him. So kind of a different path. And oh, by the way, the number one tight end recruit in the country followed him to campus uh, in Reynolds. So uh, we'll find out more about that group. We'll be back on the practice field in a matter of about two hours from as we talk right now. So go over to lines247.com here later on a Tuesday or if you're following this on a Wednesday, we'll have a lot of coverage. Photo gallery. VIP notes on what we observed out there during our, our our viewing period, and we'll get to do that on a weekly basis. And I know basketball gets underway with their postseason on Wednesday. Uh, we'll break down whenever this tournament run ends for Penn State, whether it ends with a victory next Sunday or a loss sometime between now and then. Uh, we'll get a chance to kind of give a, an autopsy uh, report a bit on Penn State with the postseason situation, uh, with how things turn out. Ace Baldwin, by the way, today named Defensive Player of the Year in the Big Ten Conference. Daniel has a story about that over at lines247.com. But today, when, when they put back up, when they go back on the practice field for football, that's going to be the conversation on this podcast. More than an hour of it, back from spring break, as I said. Uh, on behalf of Mark and Daniel, thanks a bunch for listening. Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to get back out there. Oh, I'm ready. See you in a little bit. All right. We'll go do that now. Uh, in the meantime, stepping away, I'm Tyler Donahue. Please tune in to the next episode of the Lions 24-7 podcast later this week for feedback from our first look at 2024 Penn State football practice action. We'll also break down uh, what else we are hearing about this roster and, and some other good notes as this is the time of year where a fresh perspective comes in big amounts. And that's a great thing when you spent the last couple months kind of projecting things, talking our way through changes. It starts to become a lot more tangible here in the month of March and then into April. On behalf of our entire crew here at Lions 24-7, I am Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast. We'll talk to you real soon.